Seed of self and rescued you opened up my heart to know your grace. Held by the power of freedom, you broke all eyes and found me in your dream. You see.
Faith, we have worship within us that needs to be released today, which means you need to open your mouth and you need to declare that God is King, that He is Lord, that He is the first and the last. As the scripture says, the beginning and the end. It's your worship that releases that here. It's your worship that makes that the truth. Come on, lift your hands and lift your voices right now in this melody. Let your, let your worship be that new song that the Bible says. Come on, let's worship Him right now, just right where you're at. If you don't have words to say, just open your heart and lift your eyes to heaven and declare the things that He is good in your life. He saved you. He set you free. He's delivered you. He's made your path straight when, when you needed it to be straight. He's been the lamp unto your feet when you needed a light to get you from day to day. He's the hope of glory. He's Christ within you. He's all of these wonderful things. We're not trying to evoke any emotionalism. Just worship. Just worship. See, the Word of God declares in Acts chapter 17 that it's in Him we live, it's in Him we move, and it's in Him we have our being. It's in times like this that we, in Him, unified with one voice, with one purpose, worship. Now, you might be our guest today. I want to welcome you here to faith. You may have come with a friend. You might not be used to this having an expression of worship where hands are lifted and people are actually using their mouth to worship. But I want to tell you something. There are angels in heaven that can do this 24 hours a day, but all they can do is, is what God created them to do and say only what God created them to say. And the difference between me and you is we are the redeemed. And, the, and when the Bible says, let the redeemed say so, here's what we do here at Faith Assembly Church. We let our voice become what is called the incense of worship rising in the throne of God. What that means is this. Your voice penetrating the gates of heaven and going into the courts where God himself is receiving the glory that he deserves. Your voice is a, is a voice you choose to use today. And we at faith choose to use our voice to declare his glory, to declare him as king of our life. I want to encourage you. I want to sing this one more time. And it's not to just... Again, we are not trying to evoke an emotional response from you. I'm trying to connect you to God. And the way you connect to God is when you open your mouth and you use this tongue, which is the rudder of your life, and you align it with what God wants in your life, and you give Him the glory and the position of authority in your life. And then we can go into the Word, and it'll make better sense to us spiritually. But I want to give God this moment because this is His. I want you to worship God. I want you to be free in your space. I don't want you to worry about your neighbor, what, how good you think you sing or don't. Look, there are people that sit by me that are not good singers. And they give God just the most amazing worship every week. It inspires me. Don't, don't, don't feel bad if you sit by me because that's terrible. I shouldn't have done that. But the truth is this. You have an opportunity to give God what he deserves. Unlike the angels that were created to only do what they're going to do, you choose today in whom you believe. Can we be that church that just glorifies heaven with our worship? Let's do that today.
here today. We don't normally do this during this time, but I don't feel like there is a better time to receive from God than when He is being absolutely glorified and we are unified in one voice. Just step into the aisle right where you're at. Lift your hands toward heaven and let's as a family surround those that have an immediate need right now that you need God to do something in your life. I want you to step into these aisles. I'm not going to say specifically what that prayer request is. That's between you and God. Just move very quickly because there is an atmosphere of healing, an atmosphere of release and freedom that is moving right now because we're unified in spirit and in purpose. And this is the time where God begins to move. You don't have to come all the way to the front unless you want to. You can just move right out of the aisle. And if you see someone in the aisle, we have many prayer warriors and heroes team from the freedom. We have deacons and elders and trustees. I want you to just surround those that are in the aisle right now. Put your hands on them if God's leading you to do that. Pray for them. Just, just specifically say in agreement with this prayer, we are standing with this individual that God, you are, you are supreme. You're bigger than this situation. Father, we stand right now as a body of believers, as a family, that God, each one of us and our needs matter. We're not going to just look at somebody and say, well, I don't want to be a part of that issue. God, you said we are to bear one another's burdens. We are a church of a second chance, serving the God of a second chance. Therefore, we need to come alongside each other and just bear one another's burdens. And Lord, that's enough to get us from day to day, as you would say, glory to glory, to help us out. Father, I pray that healing would enter the bodies of those that are sick today without even having a massive you know, altar call to see that that specifically happens where you are, where two or three are gathered in your name. You are among us. Holy Spirit, have the freedom to heal and to set free. Father, if, if someone has moved into the aisle that's bound by addiction, we believe you just breathe on them right now with your voice, with your life-giving breath, and you can turn that person around just like that. Father, we don't need a formal altar call. We just need you. So, God, we ask that you would move to heal, to set free. If there's an individual that came in, God, that's bound, Lord, with depression and guilt and, and suffering through the weeks with all of this stuff, you said your burden is easy, your yoke is easy, and your burden is light. Father, if by faith they would just receive you right now, then, God, they would be turned around and they could walk out of here, not under the weight of this world, but lifted by your grace. Father, we serve you because we love you because you're worthy and you loved us before we even had a chance to even consider loving you. And that just messes with me. It overwhelms me. But that's the God that you are. Lord, I want to thank you for giving us a chance to worship you. I want to thank you for giving us a chance to move in these aisles and to, to seek you in our time of need. Now, I believe you've prepared a place and a table and you're ready for us to just enjoy your company allow the words that are about to come from this area God this word right now to be planted within the soil of our heart God let it be deeply rooted into that place where you know it's going to yield the things that you need it to in our life we love you we need you in our identity God does not need to be something we wrestle with it's in you we live and breathe and it's in you we have our being it's in you all things are possible. It's when we decide to step aside from that, it's where it gets crazy. It's in the wonderful, powerful, almighty name of Jesus we pray. And everyone said amen. 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 Let's give God praise. I know there, <laughs> there are a number of you receiving ministry right now. I want to encourage you to stay in that atmosphere of worship. But I want you to greet your neighbor next to you. Get to know them by name. Don't be me that keeps coming down these aisles saying, Hi, have you, how long have you been here? Because I don't know anybody's names. Be the guy or the lady that knows the name of the person sitting next to you, please. <laughs> I love you guys. Man, well, as the lights are coming back up, I want to welcome all of you here to Faith this morning, especially those that are our guests for the first time. Welcome, welcome, welcome. <clears throat> we are one church with two locations. We have a group of our family meeting in Cypress, Texas today under the leadership of Pastor Roger Nelms, and uh, they are doing an awesome job out there. I love the fact that I get to drive by their campus, 
Every time I come to church and my heart is full, I get to see our signs that our folks have put out there in anticipation for a great number of folks that come every week. I want you to know that God's doing a great thing. And although we're here, this is not the extent of your ministry. Our ministry is local. It's in several locations. It's global. It's all over the planet. And it's because of God and our passion for Him that He allows us to be a part of that. And I'm so honored to be a part of this church. We closed a series last week entitled People of a Second Chance. I hope you were able to attend, if not one, all of those messages because they <clears throat> have kind of stirred within me a newfound desire to, to not only be a recipient of that second chance, but to learn how, encourage, to be a second chance for those around me. I also want to encourage you to come on Wednesday nights as we're wrapping up a series entitled Pursued, and it's just an incredible look at the book of Hosea, a prophet of God who is living out a life parable and in, in, in basically how God sees us, if you will, just kind of bring it into today's vernacular. And if you're ever interested in how God sees us, his love for us, and why he would choose to pursue us, although that word pursuit is often a negative term, we don't like to get caught. But we do need to get caught when it comes to God and His love. So just kind of a little snapshot of what's been going on here. Today we're going to start a new series, and it's entitled, I Found. And I'm going to leave a blank there because I want every single one of you, before the end of this series is over, to, to, to put something inside that space that's unique to you. Some of you have found relationship here at Faith. Some of you have found the Lord, Jesus, you have come to know Him in a, in a way that He has changed your life and given you eternal purpose. So you've found salvation here at Faith. Some of you have found a way to connect or value or identity, and you'll be able to place that specific word in that blank. And what I want for you to understand is coming on the heels of this last series, we're a people of a second chance, are we not? This is a church, of, a collection of people that have had a second chance. Well, in order for you to be able to express that to those in your life, I want you to know what you found here at Faith. And then you can express to those in your life, look, I'm not only a person of a second chance, but look, this is what I found at Faith. Come to this church, meet my friends, be a part of this ministry, be a part of the life flow, and let's discover what you find at Faith, and let's continue the story that God is writing in all of our lives. And that's, that's kind of the gist behind all of this. So if you would join me each week in this journey, that's exactly what we're going to try, what target we're going to try to hit. <clears throat> this is our first week of school. How many of you all have endured? <clears throat> <laughs> Gee whiz, I kind of did. Well, praise God. I want to give God all the praise. We had several groups. We, we met at three different schools and prayed and anointed those classrooms and prayed for the teachers, faculties, and staff, and it was a fantastic week. I want to thank all of you for praying for my kids. Just a little, you know, I always like to give you a little snapshot of where I'm at in life, and I have several, a couple little little kids running around the house, and they are our life, obviously. <clears throat> One of them's in junior high now. Second day of school... This one was told, you have to sit where you're going to sit for the rest of the year, the second day of school. They're going to make your assigned seating. And I'm thinking, that's crazy. It's his first year in this new school. He doesn't have any friends at all. And this guy has to sit where he's going to sit for the rest of the school year. Well, thank you for your prayers, because many of you know, I was just reaching out to you, like, pray, 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 because my, my little guy's a lot like me. He's pretty sensitive on the inside. You know, we got this thing going on out here, but on the inside, we're just a real sensitive kind of dude, you know. And, and I know the first day he sat by himself because he didn't know anybody, and he's just sitting there. I'm thinking of myself in sixth grade. Like many of you in sixth grade, we sat by ourselves because we were weird, awkward, and that was just it. The second day of school, a group of kids came to him and said, can we sit with you? So he not only has one or two, he has a group of them that sought him out that he now has friends. So I want to tell you, prayer works, especially in the schools when it comes to our kids and it comes to you know, what God wants to accomplish in our kids' life. So just a little snapshot of that. All right, so <clears throat> i got to start this series off with telling on myself. And many of you that have been here through the years, you know that I'm pretty transparent, or at least I hope I'm not uncomfortably transparent. If you brought a friend and you're trying to impress them with your pastor, not a good week. Sorry. We're going to be real honest about your pastor today. And so let me tell you a little bit about my honeymoon. Many of you have known this story through the years, but i got to just tell you a little snapshot of my honeymoon. <clears throat> it was amazing, by the way, and so as many of your honeymoons are. But this was a time that I wanted to establish my godly character it was a time I wanted to establish my future financial management skills and my wisdom and ability to protect my new beautiful bride. <clears throat> that was a plan, but it really didn't work out that way. So the truth be told, I did not have the money for a five-star experience for my wife when we got married, but I did have one of those $200 
two nights in Florida, three nights in the Bahamas, timeshare things that I bought when I was like in June, like my junior year in high school. I bought it because I thought it would be a great high school thing, to, you know, senior trip or whatever. But I didn't use it because God knew I needed it when I got married. So anyways, I had this thing and I wanted to cash it in. And uh, here's the catch. As soon as we got to the resort in Florida, I had to present my vouchers in order to get in. So, I mean, we made it. We were there. I had my little important looking bag that had all of our important documents in it. That's back when you had to travel with your birth certificates, you know, and different. You didn't have to have a passport to do the Bahamas thing, but you could do the birth certificate. So the birth certificate had my license. I had our traveler's checks because back then we used traveler's checks and we had all kind, everything that we owned was in this important little black bag. And I got up to the counter and I checked us in and the lady said, that's great, but we need you to produce those vouchers before I can give you the key. <clears throat> Honey, can we get the vouchers out of our important black bag? <laughs> it's in the folder. She opens it up. No folder. Oh, that's right. Oh, I'm in charge now. She's with me. I am the leader. And she's like saying, for the rest of my life, I shall follow you. And, you know, and she made all those vows with me. And now she's probably thinking in her head, this is the first day. <laughs> you didn't think we might need the vouchers. Anyways. So while we're trying to figure all this out, I asked the lady, why do I even need the vouchers? She said, well, you need the vouchers, first of all, for your key tonight. And then second of all, you've got to attend this, this timeshare thing. It's like a 90-minute deal. After completing that, if you make it through it, because apparently they're pretty high, <laughs> high pressure sales stuff, then we'll give you your boat voucher to get to the Bahamas where you'll get your resort voucher. I'm like, fantastic. So quick on my feet, I call our, our uh, sales, whatever they were called, and they faxed all of the vouchers to the front desk. Well, the really cool part about this story is I got all of my vouchers in that fax. So when she handed me a stack of vouchers, I was like, look, I don't need to go to this timeshare because I have the boat voucher right there, right? She's, well, actually, yeah, you don't have to go. And I, and I have my resort voucher. So is there any need for me to do anything else other than go check into this hotel, make sure I'm at the boat on time and just enjoy my honeymoon? She's like, no, that's really cool. You guys don't even have to do that. So we're like, yeah. It's like Napoleon Dynamite. My hair was like that back then. There was nothing I could do with it. There's really nothing I can do with it now. I just have a lot of gel. So don't bump me because you'll go, something will happen over here. I did the whole yes thing. So anybody that's ever watched that stupid movie understands it. So the next day we took the cruise. And here's the point. I'm, I'm, I'm rambling. Here's the point. We got to the Bahamas. <clears throat> we got in this really old taxi. We made it there. And everybody got their luggage except for this guy. And I'm standing there, and I have all of our clothes. And we, I mean, if we had to live on the beach, we could. We had our clothes, and she had all of her, her stuff that she needed to bring. That, that important little black bag had all of our identity in it, had everything in it that we needed to, to check in. Our vouchers were now present, but in the bag was not in the taxi when we got there. Are you kidding me? Well, I just was looking at my wife and thinking, <clears throat> there's nothing to identify that we're even together. If she wanted to turn me in right now for being an idiot, she could have. She could have walked right then and there, and no one would have known any difference. She wouldn't have had any, and I've never really asked her what went through her mind, and I'm, I'm reserving that for a special time in our life. I don't want to know what she was thinking. But here's, here's how this story kind of comes to an end. I don't know if it was an angel of God or God himself, but there was a, an individual that walked through the gates of that resort about 10 minutes later after I'd already, in my mind, internally put sackcloth and ashes and was wailing to God, what do I do? He walks in, and it was a long walk, but he had this strut kind of thing going. And he's carrying my fancy, overstuffed black bag with all of everything that mattered to me in it. And he walked up, and he goes, you missing a bag? And I'm like, yes, I'm missing that one. I'm thinking, you've taken everything out of it. You have my traveler's checks. You have my cash. You have my this. You have my that. And he, he handed me this black bag, and to this day, this is what stuck with me. And you can ask my wife. It's the truth, truth, truth. He goes, never forget Bohemians, the best, are the nicest people on the planet. And I took that bag and immediately went down into it and had everything in it. Now, I tell you that story because, <laughs> here's my point, without proof of identity, the ability to prove my reservations, to prove my residency, I would have been lost. Not only lost like here, but lost like literally in a foreign place, subject to foreign laws and process, I had no idea. I was in a pickle. 
This series that we've prayerfully considered is designed to help us understand not only our identity in Christ, but what you are now finding through the identity of Christ in fellowship with this new community you now have at Faith Assembly Church. I've already said we're a people of a second chance. We collectively make the church of a second chance, serving the God of a second chance. And now that you're here, what have you found at faith? This is a good friend of mine. I call him Little Jose. And I want you to see what he's found at faith. I'm Jose Moratai. I've been attending faith for six years. Faith means a lot to me. Something I learned at faith is that no matter how hard a problem is, the Lord can help us. Something I, something I like about tr faith is the Bible verses. Another thing I like about it is the fun. Something else I've learned at church is that the only way to get to heaven is by having Jesus in your heart. I got baptized so that everyone can see that I'm trying to live my life for Jesus every day. I'm thankful I found that faith is helping me grow. He'll be actually interning here at the pulpit next year. So uh, <clears throat> he's like, I've been attending faith for six years. He's like, like six years old. <laughs> All right. I love that guy. All of us are going to have a moment in life, that moment of truth where when we take an honest inventory of who we are, where we've been, and where we're going, it's during this time that you're going to want to find out the truth of who you are, how your identity really reads out, what makes you who you are what you're going to be in the future. And what I want you to understand is this one I'm going to bend you towards is this. Try not to make something up. Don't try to make that up. I want you to be encouraged to get into the Word of God to find out who you are. Don't Google it. Don't watch a TV show. Don't go to your neighbor who you think has all the answers. Get into the Word of God because in Psalms 119, this is not our scripture, but in Psalms 119, 105, this is what it says. Your Word, this is the Word of God, is the lamp unto my feet and the light into my path. I'm telling you, I want a floodlight sometimes, don't you? <clears throat> I want to see all that's coming, but God didn't say that's how this was going to be. A lamp is usually just for a little area. And you hold that lamp. He says, this will be a lamp into your feet, which will then become a light into your path. So you've got enough light to take one step at a time if you'll trust him with it. I want you to find your identity in this word. So turn with me to John chapter 10. This will be the the uh, context by which we'll draw from our experience today in John chapter 10. And let me explain a couple of things as you're turning there. In chapter 9, this is a story where Jesus actually <clears throat> heals a man that was blind. And many of you know this story, but let me explain it this way. He spit into the ground, Jesus did, made some mud, and stuck it in the guy's eye, and our eyes, and he said, now go wash in the river. Now that was crazy, and I love how Jesus did things that was out of the ordinary and so forth, but... That's really, it doesn't really have anything to do with the scripture we're going to deal with, but this is how you understand within the context of the scripture what we're going to discuss in chapter 10. In chapter 9, you have this event happening, and the religious leaders were furious for two reasons, or they were confused or frustrated at least, for two reasons. One, Jesus did this healing on the Sabbath, which for them was a big deal because they did nothing on the Sabbath. Therefore, if he did this on the Sabbath, and the, the religious leaders were supposedly connected to God, and they don't do anything, it's God's law, you don't do anything on the Sabbath, Jesus could not, he could not be from God, because that's not what God does. Okay, so that, that confused them. And the second thing was this, nobody had been healed from blindness before. And this was something that Jesus did, he spit in the ground, put stuff on his eye, said, go rinse. And the guy rinsed, and he's, he's healed. So th they b really believed that because this guy was blind, that he was blind. His sin, basically, he was born with such sin in his life that he was blind from childhood on. And that's what they really believed, that the sin in their life created that. And therefore, if Jesus healed him of those blind eyes, the act of healing him from the blind eyes wasn't the key. It was because he was steeped in sin. Now Jesus is saying, I can forgive sin. That's huge. He not only confound them in their law, but he, he also basically confirmed his true identity as not just the Son of God, but the one who literally can offer forgiveness for sins and heal the body and set 
people free. That's why I love stories about Jesus. In John chapter 10, let's go to verse 1. And I'm not going to be that guy that stops every few words and tries to explain it to you. But you got to give me permission to, to stop at least once or twice to set a few things up. Very truly is what it says. Very truly. Just understand this. God has never lied and he never will. We have to agree on that, okay? So in other words, pay very close attention when he says very truly or truly, truly in some of your Bibles. This is going to be truth. And it's going to be truth on all levels, all right? There is no bending. There is no negotiating here. This is truth. Truly, I tell you, Pharisees, anyone, the word anyone, you know what that means. But what he's saying there is the Pharisees were, were basically the insiders of the church. You understand that? So Pharisees were the people in the church that had the answers, that had the relationship with God through the law. He is saying I'm telling you this, Pharisees, that anyone, whether you're in the church or whether you're outside the church, whether you are a believer or whether you are a non-believer, whether you're a part of a Christian nation or whether you're not a part of a Christian nation, okay? Remember, this is one of those non-negotiables. This is truth at all levels. He says, I tell, you the, I tell you, Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate but climbs in by some other way is a thief and a robber. So practically speaking, there is only what? One gate. Therefore, there is only one way in. There are no other acceptable options. One way. Let's go to verse 2. The one who enters by the gate is the, is, uh, is the shepherd of the sheep, and the gatekeeper opens the gate for him. The sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own. I want you to circle his own. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. Now, I was always taught in Sunday morning education, if you will, that the sheep were led by the shepherd. And you've probably seen pictures, right, of Jesus walking in front and the sheep are following, or King David as a child, remember, as the shepherd boy, whatever, and he's, he's out there with the flock of sheep, and it would look maybe something like that without the denim. <laughs> That's really... <laughs> That's trying to bring it into today's, you know, vernacular. But there was a story that one of my dear friends in our content team shared with me. Now, this is not a shepherd's staff. We know that this came from uh, Gil, who is a, from Tanzania, and he's actually the Togue warrior. And this is his man stick, okay? So those of you that understand the Togue law, I have a man stick. I have authority to speak. Therefore, I am not naked in your presence. Sorry for this visual aid, but without a stick, a man is, is not given permission to speak. In fact, he's considered without anything. Okay, so a shepherd, in this analogy, it was brought to my attention that she's, this person said, you know, while I was in Israel, I was on a bus tour. And on this bus tour, I noticed some sheep that were being led down the street, or really not being led, but driven down the street. So the shepherd wasn't in front of them leading them, like the scripture says. But in fact, the shepherd or the person was behind them with something like this, just kind of, you know, doing this to them and getting them to go in a direction. Sheep will follow if they know the shepherd's voice, right? That's what the scripture says. So this person recognized the biblical kind of faux pas and said, look, that's not kind of the biblical image that I have of a shepherd. Can you explain to me why this guy or person is behind the sheep and he's like hitting them and, and pushing them down the road? And the driver said, that's a very, very, you know, good understanding or, or your awareness surprises me because in fact, that's not their shepherd. That person has purchased them and he's driving them to the market so that they can be processed. So there's a difference between being led by a shepherd are being driven and forced, if you will. And as we read this within its context, I want you to understand there's a perspective. Sometimes, I'm just being honest, I wish God would just drive me so that I could get into his will and I could get into the destiny that he's called me to. You know what I mean? I wish he'd get behind me and give me one of those a few times. Because I'm this guy that's, I'm, I'm, I'm all, I'm, I have a propensity to wander because I'm a sheep and that's just what we do. You may not reflect that or resemble that, but I'm not always just kind of the guy that wants to follow the one in front. I want to jump in front and say, come follow me. And we do our thing. 
But the good shepherd leads his sheep. It's when we're driven, it's not biblical. So sometimes I wish God would just drive me home, and this is just the honest truth, and get behind me, force me into his truth. But that wouldn't be the agreement. Because in Psalm 23, you know that. We don't have to go through the whole psalm. But the very first part of that says what? The Lord is my shepherd. Meaning, we don't have to go any further than that. Meaning, that's the one we should follow. That's the one that will lead us. And you know, and the word does say, if you, if you, if, if you have this knowledge of, of, in, your, in your heart, he will lead us in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. So you can always trust God to lead you to the right place. You can always trust the good shepherd to lead you. It's just you don't want him behind you doing this because then that's not truth. So let's go to verse 4. We should expect him to lead us and not drive us because that's the only way can, we can truly follow. In verse 4, when he's brought us out, again he says, all his own, when, he's, when he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they don't recognize the stranger's voice. Put this down before I hurt somebody. His own. That part I told you to circle earlier, this is what that actually means. Intimate ownership. If you like to take notes, use that space. It indicates that the shepherd, with intimate ownership, calls the sheep by name. Isn't it interesting that if, if we're supposed to be like sheep or whatever, that God would know us, and he would know us so well that he would know us by name. It's a biblical principle, and it's in here, that the sheep are not going to follow a shepherd that they don't know their, the voice of the shepherd. More, more than just that, the shepherd knows us so well that he calls us. Look, sheep look the same to me. I don't know how he would know who's who. History also shows us that often there were more than one flock that were put into this sheep pen. And I never really understood, I never really knew that. I always envisioned in my mind through Sunday school and all this stuff that when the sheep were in the pen, it was just the shepherd and the sheep. So it really, you know, to me, to know the voice of the shepherd was kind of like neither here nor there because that's the only voice that those sheep ever heard, right? Well, they're in the pen. The shepherd's there. It's who they hear all the time. Let's go, boys. Let's go. And we go. But in reality, those sheep pens house several flocks of sheep. And a matter of fact, this is awesome. Uh, in Zephaniah, Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 7, he says this, uh, God rejoices over you with singing. You just think about this for a second. Many times the shepherds, and this happens today, would go into the sheep pen and begin to sing. And the sheep would recognize the voice of that shepherd or the song that that shepherd would sing over them. And they would go ahead and line up and start filing out because they knew to follow their shepherd. Zephaniah speaks of that that our God would rejoice with singing over us. And why would he do that? If you just read it for the, for the black and white on a piece of paper, you're like, well, that's kind of cool. He's happy with us. Maybe he just likes to sing. No, he's singing so you could recognize the voice of the good shepherd in your life and line up because he's ready to lead you in these places that he's ordained for you to go. Going to get a little deep today, but I want you to understand our identity is not in this world or the clothes that we wear or the place that we work, the neighborhood that we live in. Your identity is in something far greater than that. In fact, your identity is confirmed every day with the voice of God in your life. Your identity is confirmed every day with this God that sings over you. You know what I woke up you know, this morning, I went to bed last night and woke up this morning asking God, and I haven't asked my wife, I hope she, she got this from God, but I wanted God to sing over my wife. I said, sing over her with a melody that just overwhelms her tonight. Sing over her as she wakes up. Let her hear the shepherd's voice. Let her know that when she comes up here and is a partner with this worship team, that she's worshiping you because she was beckoned out of the sheep pen, literally, to follow you because your voice led her, and it was with songs of joy. <laughs> I get excited about that kind of stuff when God sees my family in that way. You got to stop this week. And you got to create space to just hear the voice of the shepherd in your life. 
you got to stop. And, and, and maybe there's a melody that's, that he's singing over you. Maybe it's just something you just are singing all the time. Maybe that's just not because your subconscious is singing. Maybe you're picking up a melody from heaven that God is singing over you. I don't know. But this is what the scripture says, that our God, our shepherd, has a voice and we recognize it. When you hear that voice, pay attention because he wants to lead you. In verse 3, says he calls us by name. That means he identifies us as his. That's an intimate ownership, right? Well, look, uh, uh, how many of you like the sound of your name? Raise your hand. Some of you are like, uh, me. <laughs> I had the privilege of going to that NFL preseason game I talked to you about a couple of weeks ago where the, the, the Texans played the Dolphins. You know what was the coolest part of that game for me? It was neat to see the guys on the field doing their thing. The coolest part of that game was when they announced them. They had, you know, the tunnel, and everybody likes the tunnel. If you've ever played sports, you love the tunnel because that's your introduction to the field and everybody's hooting and hollering. They've got this massive, you know, bull head or whatever over the, the entrance, and they got fire going, and they got smoke coming out, and these guys come out. I know it's a show, and they're having a good time, but you got like J.J. Swat, you know, this the Swat, and you've got like Brian Cushing who hits you and it doesn't, you know, there is no cushion about this kid. He, you know, he comes out of the tunnel, and you know what they do? I was laughing at first, but I thought I would probably go berserk, too. They go, I mean, they're doing like this, and the crowd's going, and they're going crazy just because they announced their name. It's like the best play they'll have all day. And, that, you know, it's the best roar of the crowd. You know, it, it, okay, well, some of you might not obviously do that because your personality won't allow you to. Maybe you just prefer someone you respect to remember your name. That's good, too. You know what I'm saying? Well, here it is. Here's the good shepherd saying your name. And we know his voice. Isaiah 43, chapter 2 says, Don't fear, for I have redeemed you. The prophet Isaiah is prophesying this as the mouthpiece of God into, into the lives of those that would listen. I have called you by name, and you are mine. It's just something crazy cool. Knowing that the, the God of the universe isn't just aware of your existence. I mean, the guy is, it's like you, he's prepared this moment where you're running out of the tunnel, and he's like, David Courtney! And David comes like, every day of your life you should bust out of your house, and your neighbors will think you're crazy, but that would be awesome. It would be awesome. <laughs> Anyways, I think we should do a video on that. This is how I see that whole identity. Now that, you know, my honeymoon story, whatever, I was young. I'm way more mature than that now. But my wife and I were married in 1998. And uh, the day after we returned from our honeymoon, well, hold on. Wow. All right, you take, I asked the media team to help me out, but this is too much. Because they're not, they're not going to pay attention to anything. I said, what are you showing? That was the cake I never ate. All right. So anyways, we got married in 98. We came back from our honeymoon. The day we got back was the day that our ministry actually began, and it began here at Faith. I was assistant to Pastor Happy. I don't know if you knew that. I was here for just about a full year helping organize some of the support ministries. And basically, as the years went on in our life, in our ministry life, um, a question, and I, I, I don't want, if you're in leadership or if you... Well, let's just put it this way. As a follower of Christ, we're in seasons, aren't we? We, we, we are placed in, in, in leadership or we're placed in, in environments to grow and to learn and to be mentored. And to, we're all, that's called sanctification. That, that, that's that process of becoming, right? We are here today, but we're becoming. One day, all of this will be complete, and that'll be what we find in heaven. So we should never feel like we've arrived. So there was a stirring within us as a young couple you know, obviously, we're connected to the music thing. You see my wife with the teams just about every week. You might even see me sneak up here and help fill in the gaps from time to time when the pros can't make it, and I'm just like, oh. The reason I do that, the reason why my wife is, is involved in this is because one of our deep passions has always been to minister with our gift in worship. And, and it's something I never want to let go of, although I might have to come up here and communicate and speak. I don't want to ever let go of my heart of worship. That's why when we transition... I don't like transitioning with announcements and, and offering, and, and now you know why. I want to transition with worship. 
Because when my heart, now listen, when my heart is in tune with what God is doing, I feel like I have the freedom to understand with discernment of not only my head, but my heart and what he may want to do in our service. When we shut it down and go into preliminary things, I know it's tidy and it's neat and it's, it's a lot easier for our teams to deal with that, but I'm sorry, this is my comfort zone and this is my ministry that, that I can connect best to. I, I move in that gift of discernment and I have a heart of worship. That's where I'm at my strength. So that's why we transition like that here at Faith and we deal with our, our we tidy things up at the end. So thank you for that. And now you know why we do that. I don't even know why I told you that, but now you know a little bit about why we do the things around here the way we do things. But as I was kind of feeling the stirring, my wife and I decided, well, why don't we, we don't have kids yet, why don't we go ahead and explore the evangelism side of ministry because all we really know is, is, is the, you know, the, the pastoral side of ministry where we're a part of people's lives and growing with people and we just kind of are getting started with this. And so we prayed about it. And we decided, you know what, <clears throat> we're going to do this. So we told the pastor at the time that we were serving under, would you pray for us? We feel maybe that our heart is, is leaning towards this evangelism side of ministry. And, and if you'll bless us, we'll, we'll hear from God through you and everyone else around us. And, and we'll go for it if that's what we need to do. <clears throat> and we got blessing from everybody. So we joined up with my little brothers because we've all been in music and ministry for all of our lives and so it was a great time look i i truly cherished all of that and i know my wife did too but we we this is how i roll i'm just gonna let you know we left our job our house our careers to go live with my parents and drive in a van place to place with my little brothers without a house without careers and whatever and my wife found out the day we left, she was pregnant. She was going to be living up in my parents' loft. <laughs> I want a house. Anyway, so we, we've been through counseling and the whole bit. There's nothing. Look, when you get married, listen, when you get married, this is what you get to look for. This is like the highlight, highlight, highlight. And your wife is pregnant, and you lean over to kiss her good night, and she goes, you know, because she's got this morning sickness thing going on. You're like, stop! Ugh! You don't want it. There's nothing better than that. <laughs> I hope you all get married and enjoy life together. <laughs> this was an awesome time of our life because we got to disconnect from everything and just explore maybe what God had for us. And you know what we found? We thought our identity was going to be this whole music thing. But sometimes when you give God a chance, space to speak to you, and a, a, an opportunity to experience life as he sees it, he shows you the sweet spot. I'm telling you, we love traveling. We love the opportunities that we had. But you know what we hated? I mean, passionately drove us crazy burden. I'm talking spiritual weight and heaviness we had never experienced before in our life, was this. <coughs> Excuse me. We would... <coughs> We would see the altars with people making life changes, which is awesome. You can't, it doesn't get any better than that. We would pray for them, and we would look for the leadership to follow up, to have their hands on them or to be the next person that they engage, and we know that they would be in good hands, and we would leave. And here's our discussion time and time again, over and over and over, no matter where we went. Do you think those people that made those commitments were placed in capable hands? Meaning, do you think they'll walk them in their next stage of life, follow them through the next season of life like we would? Because I don't like leaving anybody. I want to stay and I want to walk them through that process. And my wife and I knew right away our hearts were pastoral hearts, although we have a gift to, to do whatever we want to do. But we need to live life together. That whole thing of loving God, loving people, and loving life together, that wasn't something we made up. That was our life as a parable. And so what we found is we couldn't do the evangelist thing and be fulfilled within our heart. God was shaping us and forming within us that our identity wasn't necessarily in a position or in a place or with necessarily a people or traveling with a group or doing this or doing that. Our identity was with Him and anybody He could connect us to. As I was studying 
and just reminiscing some of these thoughts, and you know, we kind of bring these thoughts up, and you think, God, you were so good to us, and we had no idea, no clue, but you, you, you navigated us because we found that our, our life was in you and not in anything else. And then when we thought it was something else, you'd pull us right back into the middle, and you would lead us through your word. It'd be like a lamp, and, and that light into our path, and we'd get clarity again. I was sitting in Madagascar in February this year, and I met a man named Aaron. And many of you know, you know why I was there. You see the pictures in the foyer because we're wanting to reach the people that are unreached. But this guy is over our medical missions, and he had been in ministry for 15 years. And he had traveled all over the place. He had his degree. He had his practice kind of going. He's a young guy, super smart. You think being raised in the church, doing the missionary thing, he flies a helicopter into the jungles and does surgeries on people, and he heals their bodies with the gift that God has given him while he's pouring into them life-giving, eternal purpose as the Word of God is flowing out of him. He's healing them on the outside and on the inside. How much more godly could that be, right? He should be just like loving life, just like that's the best you could think of. I mean, he's in a helicopter flying into the escarpment, reaching and, and touching lives that, that may never ever see anybody else other than their, their community. That's incredible to me. But I sat next to the swimming pool of this resort as we were eating our dinner, and he was kind of broken in his heart. And he said, you know what? I was in ministry for 15 years before God literally got my attention. And I said, you're going to have to explain to me what that means. Well, I thought my identity was in a place. I always wanted to go to this certain place in Africa, and I ended up in Madagascar. And I've always had it in my head, I should, I should do that. I should give it a shot. We should go for it. Or that one day I'll end up there. And I was always thinking that I would be ministering to a specific people or a specific area. And that's always been on my heart. It's always been in my life. And, and here I am in Madagascar, and I'm doing these medical missions. It's cool, but there's always been this thing. I was like, that is crazy to me. You, of all people, I thought were just in the sweet spot. And here's how he explained it to me. He said, recently, though, I went home for itineration, which means he left the field to come back here to raise the money he needs to survive for the next four years. It's a very difficult task. They have to raise sometimes ten, fifteen plus thousand dollars a month in monthly support just to go do what they do. That is very, very difficult. And he started crying. I was like, Oh my goodness, what are we doing? We're out by the swimming pool and he's letting the tears go. I'm like, What is going on with Aaron? He said, you know, that's crazy that I even mentioned itineration and the tears flow. Here's what God asked me. He said, do you love me? Haven't you heard that before in the scripture? Does someone like Peter? Do you love me? And he had to think about that for a second. He said, yes, but I, I haven't been able to go to this people group or I haven't been able to go to this place and my identity is just incomplete. I feel like that's what I should be doing. And God said, hold on a second. Do you love me? I said, well, you know I do. I mean, look what I'm doing. Do you love me? And he said, that was the, the moment in my life that changed everything. He said, I, I was only supposed to find my identity in one place. In Christ. In Christ alone. He said, when I turned my heart towards him, and he said, yeah, I love you. His next follow-up question was to God. Well, then I guess it really doesn't matter where I am then, does it? I can be here on itineration, and I can love you with all of my heart, with all of my soul, and with all of my strength, and I can have the best time of my life on stinking itineration. And he goes, I had the best itineration I've ever had. My kids and I grew closer. My relationship with my family grew closer. The money came in. I didn't even worry about it because I knew if I was with God, I had everything I needed. I wonder how many of us wrap up our identity in things. I wonder how many of us, you know, I wrote a, a couple of things here in closing. I wonder if, like Aaron, we want to find our identity, you know, in a people or in a place when God is saying, find your identity in me. What about like me and Cher, when we, we want to find our identity in Christ? Uh, well, basically, we want your identity in Christ to reveal the passion of your heart. The sweet spot is what we want for your life. What about like Zephaniah? You know, we need to find our identity in the songs of God singing over us to follow the good shepherd because we know his voice. I even put this down, like the Texans coming out, flexing to the roar of the crowd. We need to know our identities in Christ, and we need the adrenaline rush every single day that today is the day of our salvation. Today is the day 
that's a good day to live for God. Like little Jose, he's found a place to grow in his identity, hasn't he? So what have you found at faith? Would you stand with me? I want to give you this little snapshot of the first analogy. Again, remember with me that whole honeymoon thing, and I said I didn't, I didn't have any papers, I didn't have anything that, that identified me, my residency, the vouchers, I didn't have, I, there was nothing I could prove. Well, here's something that I want you to remember that the Scripture says about you in Christ. John 14, 3, it says, If I go, Jesus says, I'm going to prepare a place for you. I will come back and I will take you to be with me, that you may be where I am. Our identity in Christ confirms our reservation. John 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except for me. Look, I'm not only identified in Christ, but he proves my residency as Jesus. No one enters the sheep pen unless they go through the gate. In Luke 19, 10, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which is lost. I would have been lost wandering around in a foreign land without hope, but I have to tell you, today, I don't worry about any of that stuff because it's Jesus Christ, the hope of glory, in me. I am not a person without hope. You are not a person without hope. You're at a church that is fully embracing you as you are because God has fully embraced us as we are. I want you to find your identity, not in this church, but in Christ and in Christ alone. So it doesn't matter where you are, who you're with, when you're there or when you're going to get there. It's not about that moment as much as it is, do you love me, as God would say, right now. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the truth of your word in our life. We thank you that in this new series, we're going to be challenged to think about what we've found at this church as a, as a direct result in relation to our relationship with you. God, I want to be the guy that recognizes the song that's being sung over my life. I want to be the guy that recognizes the voice of the shepherd in my life. When you call, I want to be able to respond. I want to be that guy that walks out of my house every day with adrenaline in my heart, knowing that today is the day of my salvation. Today is the day that you made. And your scripture says, I'm going to rejoice in it. I'm just going to, I'm just going to soak this day in because it's yours. I want to know that I have hope every single day of my life because of you. Every head bowed and every eye closed. If you're here today, maybe you're a guest, didn't realize you would be here, or maybe you've been here for several weeks and God has been dealing with your heart. No one is looking around. Every, every head bowed, every eye closed. We do this every single week because we believe this is the most important moment of our life. When we decide that thing that we found, maybe it's finding Jesus for the first time or maybe it's surrendering to him for the first time. The only way in, to, as, as the sheep enter that gate, the only way in is through the gate. And we know who that is. It's Jesus. There's only one way. He is the way, the truth, and the life. We've shared that with you through the scriptures today. There's no other way. If you enter in in any other way, Jesus says, that's how the thief enters in. And that's not what we're going to do. We're going to do it his way, because his ways work. Every head bowed, every eye closed. If you're here today and want to know Jesus as your good shepherd, the one whose voice is calling to you, you want to know his voice, you want to hear maybe for the first time the singing over your life that he has with joy, I want to tell you that he has pursued you not to, to expose your failures. That's not what's going to happen right now. He's actually pursued you to show you and to prove to you how much he loves you and that today is your day. And I ask you to slip your hand up right where you're at so I can recognize you in the prayer that I'm about to pray with all of you. Lift it really high, please, really high, so that I know today is the day that you're, you're saying, today is the commitment that I'm going to make. I'm just going to praise God with you. There are a number of hands that went up. We praise the Lord for that. As a, an assembly, let's put our hands together and thank God that he's moving in the hearts of those who raise their hands. Here's what I want you to do. Everyone saying this with me. Dear Jesus, thank you for loving me and seeing in me what I could not see for myself. You see in me an identity that goes far beyond what I see in the mirror. Forgive me of my sin. Forgive me of my failures. Come into my life. Set me free. I will serve you and follow you for the rest of my life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 
Now we celebrate. Now we give God the praise. <clears throat> I love being at a church every week. God is introducing families and people and individuals into his kingdom. And it's not because of the worship, it's not because of the teachings, it's not because of any of the leadership or the even being greeted. I hope you were greeted. It's because the Holy Spirit has drawn you. His Spirit has drawn you. And in that moment, you yielded to that. And that's the right way for this to happen. If you raised your hand and you received Jesus into your life, there is a form in the back of the pew. It's just a, just a small little card. And it's a prayer request. <laughs> Excuse me, just a moment. A lot of people are going to be filling out prayer requests and dropping them into the offering plate when it goes by. Please put your name and tell us what, what took place in your life. When you recommitted your life, you just felt like you've been that sheep wandering, and now God's brought alignment, and you're ready to do this. Or today is the first day that you've recognized the voice of God in your life, and you got in line, and you're ready to follow Him and wherever He's going to lead you. We want to help you with your next step. You understand what I'm saying? There, are, there is life to be lived. And when you walk out of this building, we want you to know that there's an army of people believing for you, praying for you, and helping you. And we're right here. All you got to do is reach out, and we're right here. So fill that out and drop that into this offering plate. Now that everyone in this place has had an opportunity to consider being saved and a part of God's family, the Word of God says we need to enjoy communion. This is not just talking. This is actually receiving the elements. This is symbolic of the blood of Jesus and the body of Christ. This is not His blood and His body. These are just symbols of the act, the selfless act, the, the love that God had for you when He gave His life on a cross so that you could have the, the moment that you just had today to receive Him as your personal Lord and Savior. The Bible says if you're saved, not if you're a part of a denomination, okay, a part of a church somewhere, but if you're saved, then this is what you need to do. If you're not saved, I want to encourage you to just pray. Just, just observe. Just watch and ask God to speak to you for himself. You consider what this means in your own life. And if you have any questions, I want you to come talk to me afterwards. I want to invite everyone at the end of the pew on your right, my left. Follow the person on your right around. All our leadership, please come quickly before we start moving. Call the person on your left and then back to your pew. If you see that someone's sitting down and was unable to get uh, these elements, would you go ahead and, 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 and get those to them? We want everyone to have a chance to participate in just a moment we'll receive together. God bless you. Cry. 
into your hands. I hope that each time we, re we receive these elements and, and concentrate on the blood of Jesus and the body of Jesus, you understand what you're doing. And that the Lord says, this is what we're going to do until we can actually have this fellowship with him in heaven. Just so that we remember. This is just a moment where we stop and reflect and remember in whom we live and in whom we have our being. Isn't that awesome? Your identity is not in your what you think, not in your classification, not in your job status, but your identity is in something far greater than that. The Word of God says this, for I receive from the Lord what I also pass on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. I want you to hold the bread out, please. And let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you sent your son Jesus to fully understand the work that was accomplished on that cross is beyond me. You said, I only know in part now, but one day I'll know it in, in completion. And, and I, I long for that day to fully understand just how far you went to reach me. But Lord, I stand in awe of you right now. This simple piece of bread, may it be something we remember. May it be something that, that inspires us, God, from the inside out, like kindling to flame that you are our king, that you are our God, that the work on the cross is the bread of life that fuels our soul as we consume this, God. Would you watch over your word to perform and perfect it in our life? In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's eat together. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat the bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Can we hold this up together? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, again, you allowed your son to spill a blood that was not only for the healing of my body, the salvation of my soul. But God, it also initiated, if you will, a covenant, something that I still have a difficult time understanding. But what it means is that now everything that matters to you matters to me. And everything that matters to me matters to you. The difficulties of my life I don't walk through alone because I'm in covenant with you. We walk together. The victories of your life as you see the universe and, and as things will be completed, as your word says in Revelation, God, I share that now with you because I'm in covenant with you. And so as we drink this, Lord, we do this in remembrance of Jesus and what he did for us. In his wonderful name we pray. Let's drink. Now I want you to take a moment on your own to thank God for who he is, to pray over your body to pray over your family, to pray over those loved ones in your life that matter to you because you're in covenant with God and the things that matter to you matter to God. 
If you can't think of anything to pray about right now, just begin to give God the glory because the glory He received will be literally and transfer into your life because He has created you in His image. He is allowing His Son to reside within your heart through the Holy Spirit. He is with you. Where you go, He goes. You, it's not like, you know, David says, where, where can I go to escape your presence? So, Father, we just invite you to invade our lives right now. We invite you to, 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 to breathe your life into us from, as they say, the top of our heads to the soles of our feet. Don't let a living cell within us, God, function without you your direction. You said the steps of the righteous are ordered, meaning you're going to give us direction. This word will be the lamp that carries us from step to step, day to day, lamp into our feet and light into our path. God, we need to find our identity, the thing that matters most in our life, in you. God, I, I pray that your Holy Spirit inspires all of us in this place to discover what we found in coming to this church, Faith Assembly Church, to discover where our identity is, where our hope is, where our faith is, where we're going to be tomorrow. We know where we've been, we know who we are, and we know where we're going. We're going to heaven, and we're going to take as many people with us as we can. We love you, and it's in your wonderful name we pray. And everyone said amen. Amen. God bless you. As the lights are coming up, I mean, everybody to have a seat right where you're at. I need our ushers to uh, come forward to receive this morning's tithe and offering. Again, thank you for letting us kind of tidy things up at the end of service with announcements and offering and all of that. Now you know why we do it. We just want to give God his, a chance to do all of what he needs to do without any of this getting in the way. Father, we have prayed. We've asked you to bless our hearts and our hands. So now as an extension of our worship, receive this offering as unto you in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>